uh, we, we've been going through this series called um, On Mission, and we're looking at what is the mission of our church, of this church, Every Nation Taipei, and we've been looking at it in the context, oh, I love that moving graphic, kind of looking all around, and then it finds Taiwan, and then the bullseye is Every Nation Taipei, God's looking. Um, and us being on mission, we are on mission here in Every Nation Taipei, um, doing what God's called us to do here but also doing it as a part of the larger context of being a part of every nation movement of churches, a global family around the world. And so we're taking the the every nation uh, global mission statement and applying it to the church here to help us remember and stay on track with our mission. Uh, It's kind of like if you're on a sports team, beginning of every year, they set goals and set missions so that everybody on the team, from the coaches on down, we all are are hitting for the same goal. And so as a church, we all want to be headed for the same goal. So you ready? We got one. The rest of you, sorry if you're not ready. We're just going to start. Ready or not, we're going. All right, so um, so let's, let's begin. All right, so Every Nation mission statement that we've been working through in this series, it says, we exist to honor God by establishing Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, socially responsible churches and campus ministries in every nation. And that's what we as a global family of churches are, are, are shooting for. And we, we talked about how as a global church family, uh, we're currently in 82 countries. We have churches in 82 countries, but we're leaving for all 100, however many there are, 150, uh, to just say, let, let's just go do what God has called the church to do. And it's not that we're the only church, but we just want to go ahead and get busy. Amen? And working with all the other churches that are out there, we're not in competition with any other church. We don't compare ourselves with other churches. We cheer for every Every church and we want every church to be fruitful and faithful to what God's called them to do and we don't know what God's called them to do that's that's you know between them and God but we want to cheer and say go go do it you know uh, and and what we want to focus on is let's do what God has called us to do we have that that consumes all our time we don't have time to criticize others just cheer for them so we're cheering for ourselves to say number one we want to honor God in everything we do and then um, two weeks ago, we talked about what it looks like to be a, a Christ-centered church. Last week, we talked about what it means to be spirit-empowered. Uh, and, and again, so if you want to know more about actually walking that out, what does that look like, uh, come on out Friday night. Spirit-empowered. It's going to be a, an amazing time together, encountering the Holy Spirit. And then uh, today, we're looking at socially responsible uh, churches. What does that look like? What is a, what is a socially responsible church? In looking at, at t- today at what it means to be socially responsible, I've been reading this book called Unfinished, Believing is Only the Beginning. And it's, um, it's written by Richard Stearns. If you want to read a good book that really kind of lays it out biblically uh, and practically what it means to be a socially responsible Christian and a socially responsible church, this book, Unfinished by Richard Stearns, is, is a great book. He was the president of World Vision which is an um, a, a organization uh, that actually they serve over, I think, what is it, three and a half? I got to look up my numbers. Three and a half, currently today, they serve three and a half billion um, children around the world in, in uh, over, almost 100 countries. Uh, yeah, three and a half, over three and a half billion, three and a half million children, children in nearly 100 countries. Uh, just supporting those, especially in places where there's poverty, where kids are at risk. Uh, this is where they go. Started in 1947 by a guy named Bob Pierce who just had $5 in his pocket uh, when he came upon an opportunity or, or, or um, an abandoned g- little girl in China and, uh, and took that $5 and said, I, I want to give this, my last $5 here on this trip and do what I can to support this girl. But out of that, after doing that, he said, you know, I want to do more. And so three years later, 1950, he started World Vision. So from $5, one little abandoned girl, it's now 3.5 million and over a billion dollars every year that they, 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 they give towards kids. Uh, and so it doesn't matter where you begin, you just start now. We just become generous people now. We just become people who want to meet needs. That's the heart behind being socially responsible. So quick sermon overview. What does it mean to be socially responsible? Why should we be socially responsible? 
And how do we be socially responsible? Our key scripture we're reading today is from Matthew chapter 25. Jesus said this, For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you invite us into your mission. That as individuals and as a church, you've made a space for us to say, come and join me as I work amongst those who are hurting, those who are lost, those who are oppressed. And Father, today we we just want to open our hearts to you and say, Lord, um, we want to join you in that. We want to be your hands. We want to be your feet. And we invite your Holy Spirit today to come. And and God, I I pray that you would speak to each and every heart here. And Lord, we just say in these next few minutes, uh, Lord, you speak to us. You move in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so what does it mean to be socially responsible? Number one, we just look, we're just going to break it down. Socially, when we talk about socially, we're, we're basically talking about in society with having to do with other people. If you're socially responsible, you can't just sit in your room, in your house, and feed yourself and say, I'm being socially responsible because I'm feeding myself and I'm cleaning myself and I'm entertaining myself and you know, I, I got my act together, so I'm socially responsible. No, socially mean, has to do with society, the people around you, the community you live in. And socially responsible means, are we responsible to? Are we responsible for? Now, who are we responsible to and who are we responsible for? Well, we're responsible to God as His children. As Christians, we recognize that that God, we say, okay, Jesus, you are our Lord and our Savior. So therefore, we just say, Jesus, we're responsible to you. That's what it means to be Christ-centered. I know some of you here today, you, 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 you're not Christians. You, you don't yet believe that. That's okay. We invite you to listen along. And just to begin to investigate and see, this is what Christianity looks like. Today, so we're just kind of lay it out. This is what it looks like to be a Christian. This is why Christ came. This is why we believe in Jesus. This is why believe, we believe that Jesus is the hope of the whole world. And why we, we believe that we as a church are the hope for the world. And so we're going to just break that down today. And, and it starts with us being socially responsible. That means that we have a heart and a focus on the community that we live in, the people that we live around, the people that God has put us in community with, and we engage with them in relationship. And we're responsible. We're responsible to God. But we also take on responsibility for the people that God has placed us with. All right? Um, Galatians chapter 6, verses 2 and 10 says, Share each other's burdens, and in this way obey the law of Christ. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we, we, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Uh, for those of you who are doing the daily Bible reading, uh, this is from our, our Bible reading this morning. And so I threw it in this morning. Um, thank you to the people who put the PowerPoints together, because last minute they're always put, throwing stuff in there. So oh, I just read this in a daily reading. Let's put it in. And I love when it, when it just kind of all comes together like that. Uh, as I'm reading this, I think that's what it means, socially responsible. We share each other's burdens. And this is what Christ asks us to do. We're not here as individuals on our own. It's not just about, it's not about us. It's about how we can help others. And we look for opportunities to do good. Okay, so why should we be socially responsible? Christ-centered, spiritually empowered churches will be socially responsible. If you're truly Christ-centered, if you're spirit-empowered, it leads to social responsibility. And we just take that from the the very first church. So this is the model church. This is when when the church first was birthed 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost in Jerusalem. This This is what happened to the church. And so as we read the history of that church, it begins to, it creates a model for our church and really every church. It says, first of all, as they came together and they're waiting to start the church and they're meeting together, there are 120 people who got together to start that first church and they're waiting for instructions from God, praying together and saying, God, what do you want us to do? 
And so they began to say, well, we need, we need to choose a new leader. You remember the guy, if you remember the Bible story, there was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, his 12 closest followers that, that he trained for three years. Uh, but one of them betrayed him, Judas, right? And so then he went out and committed suicide. And so they're reading in the, the scriptures and they're saying, hey, we should get another person to replace him. And so verse uh, 21, it says in, in Acts 1, So now we must choose a replacement for Judas from among the men who were with us the entire time we were traveling with the Lord Jesus. So for three and a half years, these 12 men accompanied Jesus in everything that he did. This is what it means to be a disciple. It's to be with Jesus. It's to be like Jesus. And to do what Jesus tells us to do. And so they say, well, we, those of us who follow Jesus, who are with Jesus, who are, have had our lives shaped and molded by him, we need to choose another one because it, was, it wasn't just the 12 that followed Jesus. There was a whole group of folks who followed along. There's just 12 that Jesus picked out and said, no, you are my main disciples. And so they said, who's been around with us for the last three and a half years? And, so, and see, leadership in the church, and really the, because the church is all about following Jesus and we are building a Christ-centered church, it's all about people who spend time with Jesus. And we all want to be people who spend time with Jesus and who become like Jesus to do what Jesus tells us to do. So those were the leaders they chose. It's a Christ-centered church. Acts chapter 2, we go to the next chapter. It says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. So after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended back to heaven, the 120 followers who were committed to Christ got together and they were praying. And Jesus said, now, I'm going to send my promise to you. And so on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Pentecost was just a, a celebration that the Jews did um, a, a, every year, 50 days after the, the, the feast that they called the Passover, which celebrated them being freed from Egypt and coming to, um, to Israel, to the, the land of promise. Verse 2 says, suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they, where they were sitting. And then what looked like flames of, or tongues of fire uh, appeared and settled on each of them and everyone pre present was filled with the Holy Spirit, began speaking in other languages as the Spirit gave them this ability. And at that time, uh, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. And when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. And they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken uh, by the believers. And so here's what's going on. They have this feast in Jerusalem. Historians of that time um, are, not very, uh, are not very sharp with the numbers. So estimates run by historians. Uh, they, they say that Jerusalem had anywhere from... 25,000 to 250,000 people living in Jerusalem at that time. I'm not sure how you get such a wide gap, but it's been 2,000 years, so I guess, you know. But most historians say the, probably the most accurate number is somewhere between 80 to 100,000 people living in there. But during feast times, they would swell to over a million people in Jerusalem. Because people from, at that time, there were about 4 million uh, Jews living throughout the, th throughout the promised land. And, and at least a million of them, some estimates run as high as two and a half million, but at least a million of them would come together to celebrate these feasts because everyone was supposed to come back to the temple, which was in Jerusalem. And so what would happen is you have all these people coming into the city. Every hotel room is full, right? Every extra bedroom is full. And they're all there for the feast. And people from all different, with all different languages, different backgrounds are there. Uh, kind of like, it may, might be, it looks like our church. People from all different countries and backgrounds, different languages, all gathered together. And, and then the Holy Spirit comes and it's loud when the Holy Spirit comes. So for whatever reason, they're in this upper room, but everybody can hear them. And people are coming, thousands of people gather around to say, what is going on? What's the big commotion in this place, in that second, second uh, floor room? Okay, they hear it, And they're hearing people speak in all different kinds of languages. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, all these places, okay? Uh, Air, Libya, just visitors from Rome, kind of all across the known world, both Jews and converts to Jude Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, and we all hear these people speaking in our languages about the wonderful things that God has done. And so we, this is, this, the church was Christ-centered, 
led by people who'd walked with Jesus, and most of the 120 had all been around Jesus, had all seen Jesus, known him. At least the, the 12 leaders had been with Jesus for three and a half years everywhere he, that he went. Uh, and now, as they gather together, the Holy Spirit comes. So now there's suddenly Holy Spirit empowered to such an extent that people are amazed at what's going on. Um, I know when I get to heaven, I'm going to just rent the, you know, download the DVD and say, what? Or, I still don't do DVDs anymore. I'm old. Uh, <laughs> download the MP4, whatever it is, and they go watch it online and say, what did that actually look like? Because it just, my brain runs all over the place. I think, how did that, what did that look like and how did it happen? Flames of fire, what is, what is that all about? I really don't have any clue. Um, but it's going to be fun finding out. All right. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, kind of like me sometimes, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves. But my wife keeps saying, keep it shorter, keep it shorter. I'm working on it, I'm working on it. <laughs> save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. So one day, the church went from 120 to 3,000. That's a, that's a pretty good opening. Um, when we move from here, we're going to, and we open in a new location, we're going to expect 3,000 on the first day. All right, so here we go. Praise God. Come on, we got to have a vision, right? We got to believe God for something. If we fall 1,000 short, I'm going to be okay with it. Even if we fall 2,000 short, I'll still be okay with it, you know? Yeah, we're just going to believe God. You know why? Because people need to know Jesus. That's what Taipei needs, is people who really know Jesus and who walk with Jesus and who live like Jesus. They don't need another big religious institution. They don't need more religious people. They don't need another big organization that's just trying to do self-help. Or, But what they do need is people who have been transformed by the life of Jesus, who really live out that life in a way that transforms the society around them. That's what it means to be socially responsible. So 3,000 people. So this is a church now. They've, they're Christ-centered. They're spirit-empowered. Uh, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. We're believing God for more miracles where they're needed. We, we, we don't like the situations where miracles are needed. And we're not just looking for miracles for miracles' sake. I never pray like, God, you know, just give us more people who are dying of cancer so we can see miracles. That's never our prayer. But whenever a person comes with a need, whatever it might be, we want to be people who are praying and are believing for a miracle for that difficulty. So we're not here to just kind of show off miracles. We are here to try to help people. Amen? Amen. Because that's what love does. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. And maybe that's the biggest miracle of all, that they came and they had a heart to share. I love what it says. They, they sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. I mean, that's an amazingly generous people. But there's something about when God begins to change our hearts. I had a friend, you know, and, and uh, he was very wealthy. And, and I remember he bought like a, 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 a boat. He wanted to do missions with it. Uh, and then, um, this is in, in Hawaii. And, then, and then, he, then he left and he moved to Seattle. Uh, and then he started t attending uh, the church of another friend of mine. And, um, and then they, had, they were building a building. So he sold his boat and gave it, to the gave it to the church. And he sold it for a million dollars and gave it to the church. And I got to admit, I was, I was a little jealous. <laughs> I said, I'm your friend, you know. <laughs> Is that okay? Your pastor sometimes gets jealous. It's all right. Yeah, I mean, and he was my friend. But, um, uh, and I said, we, we, used to, we, we actually traveled to in the China, traveled to China by boat together and said, you know, don't you remember the times we were on a boat together? And, um, but anyway, you know, but I love that kind of generosity that people have. They just say, you know, when it comes time, if I've got extra, I'm going to give. That's the heart of God. And that's what happens when we're truly Christ-centered, spirit-empowered. So that's kind of how you can measure in practical terms. Say, man, I really, I really focus on Jesus and I have so much power of the Spirit. Well, well, sometimes you just got to put that into real action. Social responsibility kind of puts feet to what we say is in our hearts. 
and lets what's in our hearts come out through our hands. Great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Because he had all these people, like 3,000 folks who came to the church that first day. And many of them were just there for the feast. And so when they stayed after the feast, as God moved and they began to join the church and stay, you know, they, didn't, they, they lived in other places. So they were there with just, you know, their, their suitcase for the, the feast that they'd come. And then they decided to move. So there's great need in the church. And people just rose up and said, let's just take care of these expats who are here. And I love how that is the heart of God. And, you know, we've shared multiple times how like as the wars in, in, in the Ukraine with all these, these uh, refugees that are there and our churches in, in Europe, in Poland, and, and even our church in, in New York City where a lot of Ukrainian refugees have ended up, have just opened their homes, opened their doors, and, and given food. And, and uh, you know, we've, we, we've given towards that and bought vehicles to help uh, cart supplies. And, and so I love the heart of God. And, and that's just been our history. You know, when there's an earthquake or, or, a, or, or a tsunami, uh, we, we just send money and send people. And we say, go and help. Uh, the church that, that Terry and I helped pastor in, in, in New York City, that's how the church there got started. After 9-11, pastors just said, let's just go help. No flights, just get, let's just go get in vans and RVs and let's drive there and just not knowing anybody, not knowing what to do, just go there and help. And that's the heart of God. This is what we do as Christians. This is, this is what Jesus did. He looked at earth and said, what a mess. And so he didn't just say, hey, shape up. He came down as a little baby to say, I'm going to show you the, really the heart of the Father because that's what's going to transform you. He went to the most, one of the most oppressed nations, people on earth, and he became one with them to show us this is what we do. We go to the oppressed. We go to the outcast. We go to the broken and the poor. And we help. Authentic churches, this is a, a quote from the unfinished book, authentic churches truly living together offer a radically different and beguiling, attractive alternate alternative to every other model of human community. When the church actually becomes the church and we start functioning like the church, it will just begin to attract people because they'll see the heart of God. The other thing it does is it helps prepare us for eternity. Matthew 25, when the Son of Man comes in His glory, all the angels with Him, then He will sit upon His glorious throne. So we get this picture. So this is like a download description of what eternity is going to look like when this world is done. And, and we always have people that kind of in, the, in Christian churches are saying, you know, the world's going to end and this is happening and this is prophecy means that this is going to, and the world's going to end there. And, and I don't know about, I don't know all those dates. I just know that everybody up to now has gotten it wrong. But I also know, <laughs> I also know this, that we're closer to getting it right than any other generation that's lived. So that's good. All right, whoever's predicting that it's coming soon, they're right, you know. So um, it, in, 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 in historical terms, sooner than closer to today. But this is a picture into what's going to happen when this world ends and we step into eternity. This is how Jesus is going to judge us. So if you want to get prepared for the test, anybody ever study for tests? Anybody like to have a cheat sheet? Like, okay, these are the, qu the questions that are going to be on the test. This is what you're going to be tested on. I'll tell you, if you have a cheat sheet and you study what you know you're going to be tested on, you're going to do better on the test than if you don't know. So Jesus, he wants us to pass the test. Jesus never gives us a test that he wants us to fail. And that is true of this life. And so he's saying, here's the way you live your life. If you want to finish this life and know that you've done well, and that you're going to be welcomed with open arms and celebration, this is what you do. All the nations will be gathered in his presence. He'll separate the people as a shepherd separate, separates the sheep and the goats. He will place the sheep on his right hand, goats on his left. The sheep are, the, the right hand is, is, is generally the, the hand of favor. That's the, the, that's the good people, the goats, the bad. All right, so that's, that's what that's saying. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, from the creation of the world. So from creation, from, the, from before you were born, but from before you were made, you were created for this. So you have a hint, both not only what God favors, but also what God created you for. 
So if you really want to find fulfillment, if you find yourself sometimes frustrated or feeling like I might be missing out or am I really going to succeed in life? Jesus says, here's how you succeed in life. Here's how you know that you're going to pass that test. For I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, you invited me into your home. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick, you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Simple things. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to do great religious acts. Someone's hungry, you feed them. Someone's thirsty, you give them a drink. Stranger, you just take that last five bucks in your pocket and say, I want to help. Someone who's homeless, take them in. I've had a few homeless people that I've taken in um, some turned out bad. <laughs> you know, sometimes they they smell when they come in, and uh, you know they got to shower and get them cleaned up, and they don't know always. You know, they, sometimes they just are so used to stealing stuff, they steal your stuff. Um, I remember, yeah, my my dad made us kick him out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm in college. My brother and I were like, let's take on homeless guys, and we would bring homeless guys into our our apartment. You know, and my dad would come and say, uh, no, I no. You know, this is what we have. We have, uh, you know, um, departments for that and people who do that. You kids don't know what you're doing. Um, then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? Uh, then the king will turn to those on the left and say, away with you, you cursed ones into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. If I was hungry, he didn't feed me. I was thirsty. You didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger, you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, you didn't give me clothing. I was sick in prison, you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when do we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? He'll answer, I'll tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. At the very least. When he talks about least, he's, he's really saying the one you least expected to be Jesus. That was true of the, the, the church in Jesus' day. You know, the, the Jews, the, the religious ones, they totally missed Jesus, who he was. And it's easy for us in this day and age to miss him as well. Especially if we're just focused on ourselves and what, you know, how can... What can I get out of it? And we, sometimes we think Christianity is about me having a better life, but really Christianity is about me having eternal life. The life that Jesus calls us into. God's deepest desire is not that we should, uh, not that we would help the poor. God's deepest desire is that we would love the poor. For if we love them, we will surely help them. Be like Jesus. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Go to the captives, the blind, and the oppressed. So how do we become socially responsible? Close out with this. Give to everyone who, uh, what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them. In others, be, be responsible for your budget and what you owe, things you're supposed to give. Okay. Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's laws. We're to love people. The Bible continuously talks about how Jesus had compassion for people. Pay what you owe. Love one another. Live generously. Teach those who are rich in this world to, be, to not be proud, not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life to share with others. See, God wants us to have experience life, true life, eternal life, the life that He intends so that we can then share that life with others. God's intention has always been that he wants to bless his people. But his intention in blessing his people is so that we would be a blessing to others. And we don't we need to wait until we have a billion dollars. We can start with the $5 in our pocket. 
be generous with that. Jesus looked and he said, that, that woman who just gave two pennies, she gave the most because it was all that she had. We just give out of what we have in our hand to help. Richard Stearns in his last quote from his book says, love always requires tangible expression. It needs hands and feet. The beautiful simplicity of our faith is that it distills down to the exact same bottom line for both the brilliant theologian and the five-year-old child. Love God, love each other, period. Everything else derives from that. We're going to um, close by taking communion. As individuals, we want to be socially responsible. And what that means is that when we see people in need around us, we do what we can to help. Also, as a church, we want to be socially responsible. I, I love that um, you know we have James and, and Andrew who started started the Salt Collective that goes to those on the marginalized. And as a church, I love that we're a part of that uh, and that we take some of what you give on, on Sundays, uh, we take that and, and we, we give it to, to, to them because they, for us expats, we don't always know where the needs are, but they, they find the places of people in need. And, and through that, I know a number of us serve, Bertina's a part of their team and others serve. Um, I just recently met James, been here, jumping in, James, been on our, our, our prayer meetings, and you know, he serves, he, you know, they serve in prison, prison ministry. We also have Tommy from our Chinese service who serves in prison ministry, and um, we just want to be involved as a church in feeding the hungry, giving water to the thirsty, helping those without homes and those in prison. But, but where it begins, like what Richard Stern said, we, we read his quote last week, uh, two weeks ago. It really begins from having the heart of God. It's when, when we become more like Jesus, when we understand how much Jesus loves us, that's what we love out of. We don't love out of our goodness. We don't love, love out of our commitment to love. We love as a response to really getting a fresh understanding of how much Jesus loves us. Those that are most powerfully and effectively involved in helping the poor are not those who simply see the poor and reach out to meet their need. But those who help most powerfully and effectively are really those who recognize that they're the poor. We're the ones in need. We've had the humility to say, Jesus, I'm so glad that you've loved and helped me when I could not help myself. And that's what the cross is all about. It's a recognition of what Jesus did for us, that he came to earth, laid down his life for us. Because all of us, because of our sin and our guilt and our shame, we are sentenced to death, separation from God, eternity apart from God. But because of Jesus now, we can become God's sons and daughters.